Right, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name's James Anderson. Um, I talk more normally at uh, database developer or database administrator user groups. Um, so there will be a database element to this. So I'm talking about continuous integration, but it is from a stateful uh, point of view. So the difficulties that some of that brings. So I, some of the things I'm going to cover, so a general brief uh, description of CI and the complications that data has in that. Uh, ReadyRoll, which is a tool by a company called Redgate. Does anyone use any Redgate tools? Yeah, okay. So this is a tool, they acquired this a couple of years ago, um, and now it's part of their developer bundle. Um, I'm going to talk about testing databases as well, so that's going to fix some of the problems that are raised in the first section. And then I'm going to briefly talk about a build server that I'm using, and then hopefully at the end, if all my demos are okay, we'll run all the tests and everything will pass, but we'll see when we get there. So, continuous integration. Well. I first came across this a couple of years ago. Um, I started a new role at a place where I inherited a database. and This database was installed on all the instances of SQL Server that they had. And it was it had no application, no front end. All it did was perform maintenance tasks on all the instances. So it's looking at fragmentation levels of indexes and whether statistics are up to date. And it was automatically sorting stuff out like that. The problem was that people were developing new features for it in live. So this version was totally different to a version over here. So when I developed a new feature and wanted to put it everywhere, that feature wasn't compatible with various different versions that are out there. So I quickly realized that I needed some sort of single source of truth, which was source control, and which I soon figured out was going to be Git would make a lot of sense for that. And then I realized that whilst I may have a central copy that is the de facto copy of my project. I need a way of getting it out there to all the environments and I need to make that an automated process almost, um, at least a repeatable process. So continuous integration comes into that when we're working with source control. So continuous integration is a method of continually integrating. So with source control, especially Git, we can branch our code. And the reason we branch a code is so that we can work in isolation apart from each other. So if I'm changing files that you're working on, it doesn't affect you, and that's fine, until later on down the line when we have to merge the code. At that point, it can be pretty difficult. If we've been out on a separate branch and people have been changing a lot of stuff from the main branch, that merge can be quite a fraught process. So the idea of continuous integration is to merge more often and very often. So we're talking, if we've got to be pushing our code to a, a central branch at least twice a day to be classed as working in a continually integrating manner. And the reason for that is I could be working my branch and my code's working, all my tests pass, but when I merge into the main branch, someone may have changed a function that my code relied on, not a function that I changed, and now when my code goes over, it no longer works because this function works in a different way. So the merge conflict won't pick that up. Tests will, that's why we test code. But if I merge very often, I have less code to pick through, less work to roll back and change to work with this function that's been changed underneath me. So. That allows us to catch errors early. So if we're merging, we're going to see the errors much quicker, and we can fix them quicker, and they're, they're going to be a much smaller um, uh, merge conflict. And if we're all working in that way, and everyone's pushing uh, very regularly, and all of our tests are running, and we know that our project is in a good state, then we can get ideas from production. Um, we can get ideas into production a lot quicker. So. Big text, because this is a bit where I fell down. Continuous integration isn't just a suite of tools. It isn't, I've got a build server, I've got automated tests, now I'm doing continuous integration. It's more about the method. It's having the discipline um, to actually make sure you're not just sitting off in a branch for a week and then merging it back and breaking the build and everyone else has to wait behind you. It's all about having quick merges and everyone else can move on after that. 
but I will be focusing on the tools today. So, um, one of the core tools of a CI pipeline, so a continuous integration pipeline, is um, a build server. Um, some of them can be expensive if we want to use uh, uh, team services, for example, but I'm going to be using um, a free one. So I'm going to be using a community edition of GitLab, which is a free build server. I used to have hair like this guy at one point as well, so I kind of feel in tune with that and doing things on a budget. Um, but as I said earlier, I'm going to be talking about this with SQL Server. So there are issues when it comes to data. So when we're deploying changes to code, it's not too bad because code is pretty much just text files and we're overlaying what's there. Maybe we're using DLLs, we've got binaries, but we just replace what's currently there with the new one. When it comes to data, we've got to deploy changes to a live database and we've got to make sure we don't disturb that data and definitely we've got to make sure we don't destroy that data. Um, and that can be really tricky. The classic example is if I had a column which was name, for some stupid reason we put first name and surname in the same column, then someone comes along quite smart, thinks let's split those out into two columns. Well, I have to write a script that creates a new column, renames the first column to first name, the new column's last name, and then does some logic to split the data out over those two columns. So, I don't know, it takes the text up to the first space and everything else goes into the surname, but then you've got people with middle names, double barrel names, two spaces between, and it all kind of falls down. So these are some of the tricky things you have to bear in mind when pushing database changes. So two, the two standard models of doing this are the state-based and the migration-based. So the state-based model is you get a tool, and you say, here's my development database, here's my production database, and I want my production database to look like my development database. So the migration tool looks at them both and generates a script, and then you run that script on production and pray that everything's gonna be okay. Those scripts can be quite scary. If you haven't released the production for a while, you can have a really long script. It's not the most easy to read, um, and these types of tools are good 95% of the time, but the example that I gave earlier, or, or they're gonna struggle with that, or another example, say, if you renamed a column, a state-based tool may not understand that you've renamed a column. It may look like that column's been dropped and a new column's been added, so it does that and you lose the data. So they're good in, um, big team environments where there's lots of people making lots of different changes, but you've got to be careful of these issues. And sometimes you have to work around that by writing a migration script that will handle the data. So if you're gonna be writing migration scripts every now and then, my argument is a migration-based approach to this is much more of a testable way of doing it. So instead of having a tool that just generates the script, we generate the script as we develop. So we create, every time we make a change to the database, we have a little script that makes that change. And we make another one, we do another one in the line, and they're all lined up and they execute in that order. So if you have a stored procedure that needs to read from a table, you'd create the table first, then you'd create the stored procedure, because we've got dependencies in databases. So we need to manage those dependencies as well. So that order of execution that we get in these tools um, can really help us manage that. So this tool I've been using for a couple of years now. Uh, as I said, uh, Red, um, Redgate uh, acquired this, and it's a bit of a hybrid. So some of the migration tools that are out there will do migration scripts for everything. So if you make a change to a stored procedure, which is actually just code, so it's like a text file, it will add that into a migration script. So you build up all of these migration scripts, whereas this one will only create migration scripts for stateful objects, which are tables, they're the only things that hold data. For everything else, it just applies the latest version of the script on top. So we don't get lots and lots of migration scripts. We don't get really long migration scripts when we just edit one little piece in the middle of a very long stored procedure. 
we have very minimal managed migration scripts for only what they're needed for. Um, so I've got some screenshots of a run through of the of the application. So ReadyRoll was a Visual Studio plugin. Um, now this puts a lot of DBA, DBAs off straight away. They're all Management Studio people, but you can still develop in Management Studio and use ReadyRoll just to sync the changes. So if I run through the process, so initially you have you set up ReadyRoll, you've got your local SQL Server instance, and it's going to create an empty database on that instance. And there's a few steps to that. It just cr creates a database, deploys it and you hook up the project to sync to that database. And once you've connected, then at that point, you've got a project in Visual Studio, a database in your local instance. And if you make a change to the project, ReadyRoll will push that to the database. If you make a change to the database, ReadyRoll will push that back to the project. So this way, when all your items have been scripted out into a project, that's easy to source control with something like Git, and then we can deploy that later, and that could be our single source of truth for the database. So initially, once we create a database in um, ReadyRoll, we end up with, I've got an empty database here called RRTest, and the only thing I've got in there is a table at the moment called Migration Log. Now this is created by ReadyRoll, and it uses this table to log which scripts it's deployed. So if I was to create four or five migration scripts that created tables, and then I deployed them and it created those tables, if I accidentally deployed that again, the first thing it does is check this table to see if it's ran those scripts, so it wouldn't run them again. So it's, it's idempotent, it can run multiple times but not cause any issues where the state-based scripts could cause us quite some pain if we run them twice. <coughs> so, not quite yet. Um, so, um, I've got a link down here to my blog. Um, I'll post this link on the meetup afterwards, but I won't go into the details, but it's very important to get the settings right on ReadyRoll first. Um, it's quite difficult to change those later on. You want to get those right. But the thing to take away is that we're going to create a SQL CMD package. So this is just one long script. And this script will run all of our migration scripts. They're all included within it. Any post-deployment um, or any pre-deployment scripts. And it will create our database from scratch. Um, but what it will also do, which is really powerful, that one deployment package, if we had a database out in live that's at version 5 and another one at version 10, this one deployment package can be run against an empty instance to create our version 20 database, and it can also be run against the 5 and the 10 and to bring them up to version 20. So it's one package we can deploy in multiple places. Um, some more settings I'll cover right now. So my example here, I'm just going to create a very basic customer table. Um, and I'm going to create another table called a config table, and I'm create a store procedure um, that just reads those settings and displays them to whoever called the procedure. Um, so we can now see that my sandbox database, is the term that ReadyRoll uses, has config table, customer table, and that very simple store procedure. And at that point, I've finished my development in Management Studio. I go to ReadyRoll, I hit the refresh button, and it tells me that it's now syncing the changes. And then at that point, it shows me the changes. So ReadyRoll is able to detect the changes between my sandbox database and my ReadyRoll project. So what it also does at this point, if I just go back up, it's got, we've got an import and generate script button here. And this will generate scripts to migrate all of these changes. Once we press that button, another button appears to say verify scripts. And what that does is it deploys another empty database called the same thing underscore shadow. And that shadow database is what it uses to detect the differences. So it runs a schema compare tool under the hood. And it looks at the empty database and the one that we've been working on. And that's how it um, understands what these differences are. Um, so this is that shadow database currently. 
So it's noticed the differences. It's only got the migration log, which is the, it has to have that table. So when I click this refresh and verify scripts button, it will then deploy those changes to the shadow database, compare them again, make sure everything is now in sync, and then we're good to carry on developing. So we're testing the deployment of our database changes before we even push it to a um, integration area. It's kind of in the development process, so we're not going to break anyone else further down the line. Um, when we create those scripts, we get a migration script, and we also get the stored procedure script, so that's a programmable object, not stateful, so it doesn't go in the migration script. But we can also script up the schema. And this is really useful, so every table is scripted out. So we don't want to, if we wanted to look at the history of a table, all the changes that it's had, we wouldn't want to go routing through every single migration script, because we can end up having a lot of those. But if we keep these scripted out, then we can just use Git to view the history of each object as it changes. So we've kind of got both there to get the best of both worlds. So once I've verified those scripts, it's deployed it to the shadow database. That then has all of the settings. And then at that point, um, they're both showing us in sync. So this is the um, migration script. Um, you can notice it's only got the script for the tables. It's got this ID, and that's the ID that it looks up in that log table, which means we can rename this script to be something sensible, like create those two tables, um, just so the project's a little bit more readable. If we look in that migration log table, I don't think you'll be able to see that over there, but all it shows, it just shows that it's log, that it's ran my migration script, and it's also ran the programmable object script for that stored procedure. So, and it's got them marked as deployed, so it won't try and run them again. So this is the very top of that package. Um, don't worry trying to read that, it's just got some metadata and instructions at the top. The important thing is we've got variables at the bottom. So when we get that one package to deploy to any version that we've currently got and to any environment, we can set variables to say we want the database to have a different name in this environment. Um, the data files are going to be on a different path when you deploy to this server. Um, so it's quite flexible in that way. So um, it's not showing too well, but I'm basically just going to do some changes here. So I'm going to alter a column in my config table just to be a different data type. And I'm going to add a parameter to um, my stored procedure. And you see, when I sync to Ready Roll, it notices those changes, and then the same thing again. It's going to create a migration script for the table change, and then that stored procedure file will just be updated with the latest version. So, what I can also do, if I go to one of the tables, I can say include table data. So, a config table, especially for this type of database that I was talking about that's doing maintenance, I want to be able to configure it differently with different thresholds and different environments. I want to make sure that every database and every environment has all of the config options. Um, so this option will script up the data into an XML file. That will go into source control. But when it comes to deployment, it will deploy those rows into that table so they're all there ready for config. And this is me just inserting some and then when I sync again, you can see it's a data type change and it's noticed that three rows have been inserted into that conflict table. So we can manage our reference data in source control as well. You wouldn't want to do anything more than 100 or you definitely want to, don't want to do thousands of rows in this. There are ways to do that, but this way is only really for tens of rows, really. Okay. So at this point, we're using ReadyRoll to get over that difficult problem of deploying database changes. Because in continuous integration, when we're all putting in changes, <coughs> we all have to run our tests every single time. And it may be that we don't just want to test our code. We want to test the upgrade of our existing databases out there. So we want to make sure, if we're supporting version 5, that we can upgrade version 5 to version 6. So we're using ReadyRoll to get over that problem. So we're kind of 
uh, getting there, but we can still run into issues. So with some of these issues are that we've got, we've got, I'll just go past that. We've got um, actual consistent code now, and it's merging fine, and we're looking good, but we don't know if it actually makes sense logically. So it may be that we're getting no conflict changes, but the code isn't working, it's not doing what we intended. So we need to write some tests, and I'm sure as developers you know a lot about tests, but from a database point of view, C SQL C is a framework that's used if you've come across the unfortunate mistake of putting business logic in the database. So um, this can be a really tricky place. Normally we want to modulize our applications, and if we put business logic into the database that multiple modules are using, it's going to be really difficult to split those out later on as the project gets bigger. Um, but the project I was working with was just a database, and it had logic in there that I needed to test. Now, I couldn't use anything. I, I could have built a wrapper so to use other frameworks, maybe, but this is right in the code that I was building this application in. So we'll have a brief look at that in a second. Um, I also want to mention PowerShell. So I'm using SQL Server, which is obviously a Windows product. I'm using GitLab, which isn't a Windows product. So they're not always going to play <coughs> as well as like Team Foundation services would. So I need some PowerShell to kind of stick it all together. Um, also in PowerShell, you've got Pester, which is a unit testing framework for PowerShell. But because it's PowerShell, you don't just have to use Pester to test Pester, um, PowerShell scripts. You can use Pester to test anything PowerShell can do. So PowerShell can ping a server. So I can have a Pester test to see if that server's up. So before I deploy my code, I could have a pre-deployment check to make sure that server's up, make sure the availability group is actually replicating OK, make sure certain files are in certain places. So just to make sure that everything's set for the deployment. So. I'll briefly go through T SQL C. Um, this is an open source framework, and you can get it from tsqlc.org. And all it really does is you go there, you download it, it's two scripts. One script is to check that you've got CLR enabled. So you have to have CLR enabled on any server you're going to run T SQL C on, so your dev server and your test server, basically. And then the other script is the whole framework, and that would install loads of stored procedures and tables into your development database. And ReadyRoll has an option to ignore those objects, because you don't want T-SQL objects going to production. But that creates a framework in your development database that you can use to test T-SQL code. So you can group these tests as well, and the way it does that is it creates a database schema, and it calls, calls them a test class, and I can create a test class by running this procedure, giving it a name. And then if I create, every test I create is going to be a stored procedure. And they'll be in this schema. So I could just run all of my tests, or I could just run a group of tests if I'm working on that specific area. So this is a very basic function. It takes a couple of variables, and then gives a result after a calculation. Now I want to write a test for that. Um, so I'm creating a test. So it's in my test class. Um, test name's gone off the end there, but it's just um, a describable name for what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm going to run my function. I'm going to pass the rate variable, which I've said is 1.2, pass the amount, which is 2, and store the result of that. This is what I expect it to be, 2.4. And then like all unit testing frameworks, it has a, um, a collection of assert functions. So I'm asserting that these two are equal. If they're not, the test fails. If they are, the test passes. Now with um, uh, T SQL T, every test runs in a transaction. So pass or fail, the transaction will roll back. So that means when we start, the database is in a known state. After each test, it gets put back to the known state. So we've got a clean threshold for every test to run. It also means that there can't be any dependencies between tests. And that becomes really important later on. So with this test, I execute tsql.run in my um, sandbox database. 
And that gives me these results, which you won't be able to see, but it's just some fancy, um, say fancy, ASCII art, and it says that the test has failed. Um, now, when I look at my code, I realize I had a divide operator. I've changed it to a multiply. Run the test again, and then it passes. So a contrived example, but if you build up those tests, um, like any testing framework, it gives you that peace of mind when codes merge, especially when there's teams of developers merging code. If you've got good test coverage and you're confident of that, then you can be confident of the changes that you've got, which means you can make those changes quicker and you can get them out quicker. Any questions on T sequel T before I move on? Okay. So I'm not going to cover PEST though, because I think I'm a bit short on time. But I, I'll just mention it that T sequel T is purely for the code in your database, the T sequel. It gets difficult if you're trying to do anything outside of that. So this project that I had, I had to make sure that availability groups were in certain states. So I had to do things with agent jobs. So I had to um, go across link servers to check that something was there ready for the data I was going to send it. That's difficult to mock those external things in T-SQL T. You can mock tables and procedures, but not external things like that. With PESTA, because it's PowerShell and you're sat outside of the database, you've got much more free reign and you can basically test anything that PowerShell can do. So I should be able to show some of those towards the end. So I mentioned I'm using GitLab. So GitLab is a bit of a ripoff of GitHub, just you can run it on um, prem. It's a Linux server, um, but you can connect to it with Active Directory, so it fits into most teams pretty well. Is anyone using GitLab or GitHub for anything? One, a couple over there, right, okay. So it is just a central repository. It's Git at, at, at its core, so we can just push our changes, everyone pushes their changes there. But the main thing about it is when a change comes in, it notices that that change has arrived and therefore kicks off the pipeline. So new code's arrived, I need to deploy that to a test environment or multiple test environments and run all the tests and then collect all the results and only let me know if there's a problem. So it gives us that automation that we need because as I said, if we're checking in multiple times and having to run all of our tests every time, there's no room for manual steps. We need to have automation to be able to do all of that. So some of the features, it's obviously the remote repository. Um, it does our pipelines. It has issue management built in so people can raise bugs. And then when you commit the change to fix the bug, those can be linked so people can see what code you've done to fix their problem. And the documentation, is actually side by side with your code. It's not on a Word document hidden on a file share that gets lost. It's not on some other wiki that never gets updated. It's right next to your code, um, which is really useful. So, um, I won't, we've all seen build servers, so I won't go through much of that. There's just one thing right at the very end I want to show. So I think in, um, TFS, what you normally do to configure a pipeline is you actually, in the tool itself, you tell it what you want it to do. And um, so you have to tell it how to deploy the database for tests, how to run all of the tests. Um, and that's up in the build server. But with a lot of tools like GitLab, GitHub, Jenkins, it's more of a declarative. Uh, method. So you have one file in the source or the root of your uh, repository and whenever you commit code, the build server looks for that file and when it sees it, it reads instructions from that file. So this file is just telling it to run MS build and because ReadyRoll is a Visual Studio project, it will just build that project, um, which is the very basics that I want it to do. Um, and then you'll see that a build has passed in GitLab. But a little bit more complicated is, I might have to scroll a little bit here, um, we can tell it to run certain scripts. So what I'm saying is um, run an MS build, build this certain project, uh, deploy the database against the local host. So it's actually going to create the database and not just compile 
the project. And, and it's going to generate that deployment package. So I'm, I'm going to have multiple phases of my build. I'm going to build from the source code. It's going to create the database. Next phase, I'm going to run the tests against that database. And then that package that was created, I'm then going to deploy the database again with that package. So I'm testing that the code makes sense and does what I want it to do, but I'm also testing that that deployment package actually works. And I could have that deploy against multiple environments to test all sorts of different things. So, so we're getting there. We're, we're getting close to being continually integrating now. As long as we've got the discipline to do it often enough, we're, we could probably say that we're there. Um, but we can always do better. Um, so if I, if I, in my uh, situation, I had to support 2008 up to 2014, so all the versions of SQL Server in between. So I'm probably going to want to test not only my project, but the upgrading of my project on all of those environments. So I'm going to need to have uh, instance of SQL in the test environment for each different version. I'm also probably wanna, gonna test that I can upgrade every version that I'm supporting. So if I'm supporting version five of my database and I'm a version eight, I wanna make sure that I can upgrade version five, version six, and version seven to version eight. And I wanna make sure I can do all of that on every version of SQL Server. And then maybe there's um, service packs in between. Suddenly I get lots of environments, and this is like the, one of the biggest problems in IT, it's provisioning test environments to be actually l anything like production. Like, has anyone got test environments that are close to production? There's not... <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly think this is one of the biggest problems. Um, and you can see how, you can see why this is such a problem, because one change in production means I have to update all of those environments. That is a pain. I want to upgrade all of my versions. This could be the answer. Um, anyone using Docker? Yeah, a few. Way more than in da database groups. Like, those guys, us guys, we haven't really heard of it. But I was coming across this problem. I was really struggling. And just from reading a few things out there, this is what I came across. So this, for those who haven't touched on it or used it, this is really important and it's changing a lot of um, the industry. Now, Docker is actually a brand name. You know, This technology underneath it is called containers and it's been in the Linux world for years, a long time. Um, but it took these guys to come along with a fancy API, some nice um, logos and some stickers to put in your laptop for people to be interested. <laughs> now people are really interested. Microsoft are pouring loads of money into this. They're, they're really trying to catch up because Docker, until fairly recently, didn't work on Windows. It's really a Linux thing, but they're getting there. Um, but what it is, is kind of like VMs. So they look like VMs but they're really thin VMs. So they don't have to emulate all the hardware like a VM does. They don't have to run their own kernel like a VM does. They share the kernel with the host operating system. So what that means is they're really quick to boot up. And what that means is that we can have infrastructure as code and we can spin up environments on demand. And we don't have to have all of these environments sat around doing nothing until tests come along. We can have just some environments, physical or virtual machines. They can be sat there waiting for tests. And we can have Linux projects, Windows projects, IIS, SQL Server projects. And they all come into the same infrastructure and get deployed in the same place. So we're really condensing, getting much more density. And if we then use those same images to run in production, we no longer have to update the old stuff. We're actually using the exact same infrastructure in our test environment. So, you might have to crouch a little bit here, but um, if I 
show you a little bit what Docker's like. Um, I can briefly show you, just before I get to that, what PESTA is like. So I've got a suite of PESTA tests here that I've written. I don't know how well you can see those, but you see they're pretty basic. We, we wrap them in a described block, and then we group them in a context block, but it's just semantics, really. But what I'm saying here is I've got an individual test. I want to make sure that Zoomit's running. I want to make sure that Slack's closed so I don't get notifications halfway through the talk. I want to make sure that Excel's closed. So I'm saying check that those are closed, and if they are, then pass the tests. Um, it just shows you the flexibility of PESTA. You can use it for so much. So if I run this, it shows that my, I'm ready for my talk. Everything is green. Um, if I was to unplug my laptop and then run that again, we see that that one fails. So I don't want to be halfway through a talk and realize that my laptop's not plugged in. So again, a little bit of a contrived example. Um, I can find it. But you can test absolutely anything with it. So, what have I got here? So what I've written, um, let me just find that. I've written a PowerShell, um, a PowerShell module, which basically uses Docker to give me the parallelism that I was talking about earlier. So, what I need to do is, as my project gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I get more and more tests. It's going to take longer and longer to run all of those tests, which means we can't be continually integrating anymore because it's taking too long. So we need to make that quicker. And the way to do that is to not stop writing tests. We don't want to do that. And we don't want to delete tests. So we need to run our tests in parallel. And we can do that with Docker. So with Docker, we can on-demand spin up multiple copies of each version of the environment we need to test against, split our tests into groups and run them across those in parallel. Now, on a big beefy server that can run loads of containers, it would be quicker, trust me. On this it won't be, because it's a two-core laptop. But I'll show you that it does work. Uh, so if I go to uh, Docker, Can you uh, zoom in as you do that, please? Yeah. Just bring that up. Right. Can you see that across the top? Do you want me to zoom in? Yeah. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so I've written this PowerShell module just call it Pester Max for the moment. And I'm telling it to go to this directory to find my ready roll project. And then I'm telling it to go to this path to find my tests. Now in that path, I've got five uh, PowerShell scripts that are all tester tests. So they're checking to see if SQL Server is configured correctly, if my database has been deployed correctly, and all sorts of things like that. And then, uh, this is tricky. I'm then saying, use the latest Docker image of SQL Server. And I've got a degree of parallelism uh, variable here, um, parameter, sorry. And I'm saying two. So what I want to do is, for that version, deploy two containers of that version, split my tests into two, and run the first half on that one, the second half on that one, then gather all the results together into one place to get that parallel. So if I ru run that, <coughs> so that's spinning up two containers of one version of SQL Server. And if we were to look at what effect that's having, we can see that my memory consumption is going up and my CPU is going up pretty high. So what's happening at this point is it's spinning up two versions of that image of SQL Server. It's then waiting for SQL Server to come up in each image. It's then looking at that folder that I've got with five PESTA scripts and it's going, 
right, well, take those three, run them against that container, take those two, run them against that container, and then it's going to, at the end, gather them all up into one folder so we can see the results. But this little thing is going to struggle. So if I run a Docker command here, we can see that so far, um, you don't need to see the details, you see there's two lines. So far, it's created those two containers. So those containers are up and running. They've been up and running for 24 seconds. Docker's got this weird thing where if you don't explicitly give a container a name, it creates this weird random name. So I've got Vigilant, Swartz, and Pedantic Kumpf, uh, <laughs> which is uh, bizarre, but it's quite funny. Every, you get different ones every time. It's really weird. So, so you can see the script's finished, and obviously the, the, the effect on my machine is quite obvious. Um, so the output is just showing where the tests results have gone. So if I go here and zoom in to that, you can see that I've got five results. So this is from each one of my pester scripts. It's got different IP addresses that shows you that it ran on different containers. And different names for whichever test that it ran. Um, now these aren't the prettiest of things at the moment. This is just the raw output from um, PESTA. But what we can see is that there, my database was deployed to those containers. So my database is RR, ready roll test. And then it's run those tests against those. So on decent hardware, we're going to run in parallel. We're going to save time. Not so much on this one. So I do have one last demo, which will probably destroy this laptop. Um, and it will take some time. So I'm going to let it run. But I'll, I'll explain what I'm going to do with it once that opens up. So same function as same module as before, so the Pestamax thing that I've written. But instead, here I'm saying I want to run tests on the latest version of SQL Server and this version, which is a preview version of the latest one. It's the only one that I've downloaded. Um, I'm still saying a degree of parallelism of two. So if I execute that. And if we look at my machine, so this time it's spinning up four containers for two different versions. So we're getting two containers for each version. So we're going to run all of our tests on this version across two containers and all of our tests again on this version against two different containers, but all in parallel. Um, it will also, the scripts that, uh, so we've got three containers three scripts running on one container, it will run those in parallel as well. So we've got like nested levels of parallelism, inception type stuff going on. And yeah, it's, it's going to be there for a while. So I'll just go back to a slide. I think I've got one last one. Uh, so that is kind of how I'm trying to achieve continuous integration. Um, I'm trying to get it so that what comes out of the end of that is that package. I know it can run. I can run lots and lots of tests in parallel and keep continually integrating and use that one deployment package to update every single environment I have. Um, I'm going to leave it there. If you've got any questions, happy to answer them now. Or if you, <coughs> we've got time now, Steve? Yeah, we've got time. Yeah? OK. Do you work solo or do you work in a team with other developers? So until about six months ago, I was in a team of DBAs. So we were purely, um, we had a whole team of developers, but it was old school, like physical wall in between us. Um, stuff got chucked over, we deployed it to production, and if it went wrong, we'd moan about developers and the classic stuff that happens in old places. And that's where I came up with this. Well, I didn't obviously come up with any of this, but this is where I found out and looked into all of this stuff and got a pipeline built. So, you know, we want to get 
closer to more like DevOps type stuff where developers support the stuff they build instead of they make the changes, chuck them over, and then someone else has to deal with that. With reference to the ready world and working with a multiple team, are you finding it easier that people contribute towards the Visual Studio project rather than Management Studio? So I don't use them. Um, well, so there's a there's another option from Redgate called SQL Source Control. And you may have seen it. Um, that's been out for a lot longer, and that's a plugin for Management Studio. And people were using that a lot. Um, I personally find Ready Roll much easier, probably because of some of the reasons you're alluding to. The fact that I've got built-in source control and I can just push it up because Management Studio doesn't have any source control capability. Um, the difficulties come with branching and merging those branches. So we have to be quite disciplined on how we name our migration scripts, how we prefix them so we don't get merge conflicts because it numbers them. So it prefixes the migration script of a three digit number. So if I've done two changes to version five and you've done two changes to version five, we'll have scripts appear and yours will have 001 and mine will have 001. So it doesn't know which one to run first. It'll go down to alphabetical order. So you have to manage that on merge. So that can get difficult if you've got lots, big teams merging lots of changes. That's why I mentioned the state-based tool can work better in that situation, but you've still got the problems. You're going to have to write migration scripts at certain times with data, and it's a bit scary. Um, I, th I think you've come from a DBA background, and a lot of people here are devs. Yeah. Um, where do you see that line kind of being drawn, some of the content that you've gone through today? How much would you anticipate that the .NET devs to be doing? nowadays, like all of this, or do you still expect some kind of hand over the wall? So, yeah, it, it depends on the environment. Um, it depends on the nature of the application as well, I think. So if it's uh, if you're a startup and it's a product, then I think you should have end-to-end -end continuous delivery. Everything should be all automated, and that should be down to developers to build that. When it's something like a financial application and it's you know, massively data orientated and that's really serious and you're not allowed to have that, you need to have those gated deployments because you're not allowed to do it automatically, then I think um, developers can only go so far of that path or they usually only go so far down that path. Like I said earlier, DevOps is all about, you know, automation but it's also about developers looking after their code in production as well. So I think DBAs are a bit old school and the the role of DBA is becoming much, much broader. So I don't know a single DBA who isn't really a database developer as well. Um, and now with all the cloud stuff and having to know these pipelines and work with these, I think someone who just goes in every day, flips a few switches, restores a couple of databases, I think that's gone.